Hello and welcome to another Ancient Warfare magazine podcast. This is another one of those in-between episodes we're sandwiching between issues five and six of the magazine. The consensus after our chat about Ben-Hur was to look at Gladiator. I thought we should keep our powder dry, but I was overruled. So we're looking at Gladiator. So as not to be here all night, we've settled to look at just the opening battle scene. If you sent us a question via Facebook or Patreon, that's patreon.com slash ancient warfare podcast if you want to find us there. Um, thank, thank you for sending the question. We have never had so many questions posted. I will endeavour to get them all answered and I apologise if we miss any. So let's get started. Joining me are Murray Darm, Mark McCaffrey, Mark DeSantis and David Renke. Chaps, shall we start by looking at the film? It's a reboot of the traditional sword and sandals epic and the first big one for 40 years. Uh, David, do you want to kick us off? What can you what can you tell us about the film? This film came about as part of a three picture deal that uh, David Franzoni, the screenwriter, had with Spielberg. He had written a film for Spielberg called Amistad about a slave ship. And that had done very well. And he came up with this idea for writing a film about gladiators. And obviously this is based heavily or borrows heavily from the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, almost, for those of us who've seen the first film, literally, fortunately for Franzoni, most people weren't familiar with the earlier films. So they thought this was all good and original. Um, they originally had Mad, Mad Max involved. They originally had uh, Mel Gibson slotted for the part of Maximus. That's one of the reasons he was called Maximus. And in fact, if you read um, several books that, uh, of critiques about the film, they talk about how this film refers back and follows the hero's journey as outlined in the Mad Max trilogy. Yeah, it does, sort of, kind of. That's all fine and good. Uh, Gibson got dropped, and um, another Australian, um, Russell Crowe, got picked up almost immediately for it. He, his name came up uh, very quickly. Scott was interested in it, but he didn't like the script. He didn't like the dialogue of the script. He liked the story, but he didn't like the dialogue. So they brought in another writer, uh, pumped it up, and then started filming. And they started filming with the first battle scene. And they were fortunate in that where they were filming this, the, um, the British government had decided to destroy that forest, to deforest that area. And Ridley Scott said, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it, I'll burn it down. Which now gave him free reign to do whatever he pleased because most movie crews need to restore everything to where it was when they first got there. And now they didn't have to do that. That saved them a ton of money. Nothing else went right for the film after that. Uh, there were problems with actors. There were problems with sets. They wanted to build part of the Coliseum, which cost them a million dollars and took months to do. And then from that one small section they built on a one-to-one -one relationship, they would use CGI to fill in the rest of it and make it look like a full um, Coliseum. Uh, Russell Crowe didn't like the dialogue either. And at one point he told a screenwriter, the dialogue you've written is garbage, but don't worry, I'm the best actor in the world. I can make even garbage sound good. Um, so he came back. In fact, he even walked off the set at one time because no one seemed to be paying attention to what he wanted to do. Uh, but he reconciled himself that he'd signed on, he would do it, and he came back to the set. The film took the, the audiences by storm because they hadn't seen anything quite like this in a while. Now, they'd seen a lot of science fiction films, the Star Wars uh, series, that sort of thing, but nothing like this, not a throwback to ancient Rome. Uh, most of them weren't familiar with the fall of the Roman Empire, so this was all fresh and new. It did very well at the Academy Awards. It was nominated for 11 and got, uh, if I remember correctly, eight awards. I'll look at my list here real quick and just double check that. Um, well, it gets Best Picture and Best Actor, which are the big two, isn't it? It did, it did get Best Picture, uh, Best Actor in a Leading Role, Best Sound Effects, Best Visual Effects, and <laughs> Best Costume Design. And I guess we'll all have some contention <laughs> about that as it progresses. Um, interestingly enough, though, as well as it did at the Academy Awards, it lost money. It did not turn a profit until several years after release. Uh, and in, in my first... Uh, article for Ancient Warfare magazine on the box office uh, gladiators. Um, I talked about this film in comparison to Ben-Hur, how both had done very well at the Oscars, a lot of nominations. Ben-Hur had actually 
cost a little bit more, but had taken in much more money um, than Gladiator did. Gladiator has now turned a profit, but initially it hadn't. However, because it won the big Academy Awards, it had no adverse impact on Ridley Scott. He could now do whatever he damn well pleased in terms of Hollywood. Uh, money matters. Money's very critical, but every studio likes that prestige. Now, this was a DreamWorks film, but DreamWorks couldn't hazard the $100 million budget. And so they made a deal with Universal on a co-production to co-finance and co-distribute. So Universal made some good money on this also. Um, the film, critically, the critics seem to like it. Uh, but when you start talking about historical accuracy, we start entering into all sorts of interesting problems. The sequel was envisioned. Uh, it was talked about because they'd made so much money, but it's never materialized. And I don't think it'll ever see the light of day. And now having said that publicly, I'm sure a sequel is now going to suddenly be announced. I found a, I found a film called Kingdom of Gladiator which apparently came out last year when I did the when I did the Gladiator YouTube search and I'm like oh my gosh this looks awful but uh, that 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 could have been you know with its bad grammatical title I thought it might have been a, a sequel it's possible there's a there's a film company here in town called Asylum that um, enjoys doing those sort of low budget type of films and that they did a, a sequel as we talked about last time of Ben Hur uh, in the name of Ben Hur where Ben Hur magically escapes from Rome. I'm not sure what that's all about since he's a Roman citizen, but he escapes from Rome to, and he goes to Britain. Why he would choose Britain, I have no idea, but I guess it's a good place to hide out. And and from there on, it all went downhill from there. If you've seen the film, you don't even need to see much of it. You can see the trailer and that will tell you exactly everything you need to know about that film. Um, the, writer of the, the writer of Gladiator, David Frazzoni, also wrote King Arthur, another film that delves in the the Roman period in Britain. Uh, it's that one uh, that we're all thinking of, uh, the, the most recent one, not the one uh, that, uh, not Excalibur. With Clive Owen in it, it's a bit creaky. Tell, telling us that uh, it's historically accurate, that it's, you know, it's a, it's a fact. This film did have a historical consultant, Professor Kathleen Coleman from Harvard. She realized almost immediately they weren't gonna pay attention to anything, he said. <laughs> And she asks that her name be taken off the credits. Now, they do give her a thanks to, but they don't say anything about what they're thanking her for, just thanks to. Um, so they did give her that much credit. And of course, that's not unusual. Technical experts are not listened to. Occasionally, they might get a point here or there, but in most times, nobody pays attention to them. When Disney did the black hole, they hired a couple of NASA astronauts to come on board to be technical analysts technical advisors. And at one point they said to the producer and director, you know, when these guys are going from one spaceship to the other without their helmets on, they're gonna die, right? You, you realize that. At which point the director said, we paid a lot of money for these faces and we have to have the audience see these faces. And the astronauts said, sounds good to us. And they cashed their paychecks and stopped worrying about it. Um, and that's what I think most advisors have to think about well, when they go into these kind of projects one quote i found reference to this and i can't i'm not i should what i failed to do is write down who it's from um i could have been a writer some historical some historical facts are just too un unbelievable to be included yeah. <laughs> well that and that it raises the question something we 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 touched on the last time we talked um this idea of of what what level we need to hold these films to in terms of historical accuracy. And as we go through the discussion of Gladiator, I think we'll all have lots of um, things to say about what's right and wrong with this film, probably heavier on the, uh, the latter. Um, because every film plays a little fast and loose with timelines. Uh, they compress events, events that might've taken a year suddenly look like they took an afternoon or a month maybe. Uh, characters are sometimes uh, combined. Some characters are dropped completely. But that, that quote raises the interesting point, because as we know, oftentimes the facts are far more fascinating. The question is, would they be fascinating to a general audience? And that's what the director and the producer are weighing, is will the common man coming in off the street be fascinated by those facts, those ironies, those little tidbits, or do they want to see more explosions? Well, well another interesting point along that line, then, if you're... If you know, there's a, such a long gap between uh, Sword and Sand, Sandals movies being produced. Now, those old, older style ones uh, were quite um, moralistic, Christian-based story themes, 
voiceovers. Uh, you know, there is a, a sort of message to it. Well, you get to Gladiator, and frankly, it could be Star Wars. It could be in space. It could be. It, it's just they've just parachuted the story and you it, it, into uh, the Roman Empire. So you, you you you're not necessarily um, trying to sort of really fit. I mean, they they put factual people in into a very fictitious sort of setting, if that makes sense. To, pro pro to progress the story. The film Centurion does that almost exactly. Centurion could have been set yeah. in the Star Wars universe with clone troopers caught behind the lines and fighting their way back to their base. That's pretty, It's a chase movie. It's a standard Hollywood chase movie. It just happens to be a chase movie in Roman Britain. Yeah. The, the, well, the nice thing is, is that the actors are so good, it, it works on a lot of levels. Historically, well, and then that enters a whole other realm again with the Ninth Legion and, and all of that. But as a yeah. chase movie, yeah, it works. I think Franzoni said that um, his concept for uh, King Arthur was basically it's a it's a Vietnam era um, special forces unit caught behind lines who need to get back to their own. And you're like, oh my gosh, that's that's yeah, again. And I think that's one of the problems is of course the contextualization of stories because people are not familiar with the ancient world uh, or the medieval world, um, the contextualization tends to be late 20th century contextualizations of special forces units behind the lines, World War II, World, you know, Vietnam War onwards, because that's the only concept of what warriors do. Um, uh, I mean, similarly, you can, you can, you can almost take some of the, the more recent uh, films about the, um, the conflicts in the last 20 years, and you could put them in Roman garb, and it would be a fabulous sword and sandals epic. Um, but well, the, uh, the, the hero has a thousand faces. Yeah. The Arthur film came off a bit of um, scholarship, though, at least, because there was sort of a little bit of a, you know, running on theory sort of thing led by a guy called John Morris, I think, at one stage, releasing books along the lines of uh, linking Arthur to, Ro to Rome and sort of running with it. But not that they had much to run with. Um, but it sort of tailed on, you know, somebody had somewhere got hold of that and uh, ran with that story. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was. I think it's also about the presentation um, and coming back to the idea that what what level of accuracy do we hold them to? And I think sometimes it's about well, what level of accuracy do you hold yourself to? If you're saying that your yours is the most historically accurate film ever, and that you're presenting facts, we can hold you to that and go, no, you're not, and you're wrong. But when you're when you're saying, oh, it's a piece of fiction, it's a Vietnam behind the war, you're like, oh, okay. When they do both, when they go, it's both historically accurate and it's a Vietnam war behind the lines scene, you're like, hang on a minute, how does that even work? Um, but anyway, but I think I think one of the things with Gladiator is, of course, that even as a remake. Um, Fall of the Roman Empire wasn't a Christian epic, so it was kind of unusual in that sense. Um, and I think one of the other things that, uh, you know, they say, oh, well, it, re it, it was a rebirthing of the, the sword and sandals epic, but I don't think Gladiator would have been, cap would have been possible without uh, um, Braveheart from 95. Um, I think Braveheart really set the, hey, we're, we're, we're prepared to see medieval combat or ancient combat again. Um, it's very different to the earliest sort of sword and sandals movies, though. There's not, as you said before, there's not the moral story. There's not the the Christianity, um, which is I think drawing a lot to the um, to the earlier movies and whatnot. It is sort of taking the whole you know genre in a different direction. Like with all of the questions we've received, I think it did more for Roman history than anything else could have possibly. And when I was teaching at the time, the number of people who came to Roman history courses because of the film was, a, was f phenomenal. Now, we, we lost a lot of them as soon as we said, well, actually, that's not what happened. And, you know, that's not how this works. And that's not how history works. And that's not, you can't footnote Gladiator. Um, in your in your stage one Roman history essay, um, I don't know. Mary Beard does a very good job of it in one of her books. <laughs> uh, just to, just to mention well, that, I mean, <laughs> well, I think Mary Beard Mary Beard's uh, history is backed up a little bit better than someone who's just come out of yeah, uh, okay. year twelve. Okay. Um, but but um, but at the same time, the number of people who stayed on to discover the reality of Roman history and and Roman warfare and even gladiatorial combat, you would never have captured them in the first place. So 
I think as as Roman historians and military historians, we have to be grateful to Gladiator because it did the bet uh, the best PR job that we could never do. I mean, if, if we're calling it historical uh, and histo- historical sort of fiction film, um, is it an advance on previous sort of cin- cinematic depictions of Rome? There's improved feeling about you know that they do get some of the the ideas in there a bit more you know some of the uh you know a set sense of uh, the urban landscape of rome you know not much but there's sort of you know teasers as such it sort of teases with the uh, some of the ideas that you play with in terms of how the uh, gladiator fights actually played into the you know the idea of emperor and people developing a relationship um in rome which is unique in terms of civilizations that you ha- you have this relationship and it is the meeting point as such um there's you know as i say the, the warfare at the very start i mean that's a horrible tempting <laughs> little piece that sort of yeah it, it it all sort of hints at all these wonderful little bits and pieces of you know the real essence of roman history but never really gets into into detail in them sort of thing it, it was down to set a new benchmark in raw reality. And now, curiously, I've just read uh, a book uh, on the making of um, uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where t- Terry, it's Terry Jones, isn't it, uh, says that he, he all the mud in it was because he wanted to make it real. And I sort of suddenly had visions of uh, people in Gladiator sitting on the floor eating mud to try and make it look more real. But there is that sort of, let's just put more mud in it because mud is real. Uh, and certainly that opening sequence, you know, you couldn't get more mud in it if you tried. <laughs> there's, there's some lovely filth over here. Yeah. Oh, it's right lovely. Yes. Um, it's, that, it's that strange world where, where, where uh, you know, clearly the ancient world, to make it real, has to be dirty. Um you know, it doesn't it doesn't shine uh, like in in uh, in the films from the forties and fifties in glorious te- technicolor. <laughs> um, so we we we're, we're going to try and stick to the opening sequence, but before we get there, I mean, shall we have a look at um, how much uh, is there a, is there a, is there a, a, a second century historical figure we can pin? Uh, Maximus Decimus Meridius on? Well, I was did some uh, sleuthing, and I came across uh, three figures, only two of which I can connect uh, to the movie. Uh, one was Marcus Nonius Macrinus. Now, he was a consul in 154 AD. He was from Italy, grew uh, from Brescia. He was one of Marcus Aurelius's generals. He was the legate of Pannonia. He also was a governor of, uh, sorry, a legate of a Pannonia superior uh, later on in the uh, 150s and early uh, 160s. He uh, was the proconsul of Asia, too. Uh, he was one of the Marcus Aurelius's generals, uh, had a fine career after Marcus Aurelius's death, unlike uh, Maximus. Uh, so that was a big difference. Uh so, uh, and interestingly enough, his tomb has been found in Italy way, uh, back in 2008. So, uh, we, we know a little bit about him. He s- sounds somewhat like Maximus. There's also uh, Tiberius Claudius Pompeianus, who was, uh, if you were going to say that, uh, you, you, almost like Marcus Aurelius's right-hand man during the Marcomannic Wars in the... Uh, uh, 160s, 170s, uh, he ended up marrying Marcus Aurelius's daughter Lucilla after the death of Lucius Verus, her first husband. So he became uh, Aurelius's uh, son-in-law, showing just what an important person he was. He had a number of uh, important commands too. He was the military governor of Pannonia. He also defeated an invasion of Lombards. Uh, that took place somewhere around 166 or 167. So he was another one of those military figures who worked closely, very closely, with Marcus Aurelius. And uh, he also is one of those, uh, he's been suggested as a possible uh, historical uh, uh, model for uh, Maximus from Gladiator. Now, the 
most interesting of all these figures that I came across, I was never able to actually tie him directly to the movie in any fashion, but he is such, uh, I mean, an interesting figure and such a, in a way, a close model of what you would expect, you would think Maximus was if he was a real person. Well, first, uh, his name is Marcus Valerius Maximianus. So I'm thinking it's right there, the name was close, but maybe uh, considering what David uh, said earlier, that uh, Maximus got his name for an entirely different reason. So, so uh, Valerius Maxim Maximianus, he uh, was born in Poetovio, uh, the modern Patuge, in, uh, in, uh, and he, so that, that was Pannonia at that time. It was originally the base for the uh, 13th Gemina Legion, dating back to the first century. So there was probably a very strong military feel to where this man was born, grew up. We, he is not mentioned in any surviving literary source. However, there are inscriptions uh, that survive which uh, uh, talk about him. One of which is actually uh, was an inscription set up by the town council of Diana Veteranorum in modern Alger in Algeria, and it's something of a curriculum vitae of this man. Uh, he was the governor of Diana Veteranorum after the uh, after all of these wars took place. So it, it's essentially a running list of all of the honors he won, the appointments he had, every post he held, and this was an astonishing career. Uh, for instance. Uh, he was tasked by Marcus Aurelius in the early part of the Marcomannic Wars with bringing uh, supplies down the Danube uh, you know, via boat to the armies further, uh, further downriver. Uh, he was also made commander of s several units of cavalry, uh, where he performed exceptionally well. Uh, possibly his most uh, extraordinary exploit was he killed a in personal combat he killed a chieftain of the uh, a quadi chief, sorry uh, there was a chieftain named Vallejo of the tribe of the Naristai a tribe that you know most people have not heard of uh, as one of the smaller Germanic tribes that uh, north of the Danube and killed him and in uh, for these deeds and other services he rendered, Marcus Aurelius uh, personally honored him in, you know, in front of his troops, gave him various decorations, gave him a horse as a gift. And I was thinking about how similar that sounded to uh, or, or, or seemed to when uh, Marcus Aurelius walks with uh, Maximus after the battle and he's you know, more or less saying, you know, they're, they're cheering for you, right? Uh, and then... Uh, apart from ha holding all of those commands, he was made commander of the cavalry contingent that was sent east in 175 to put down the rebellion of Avidius, uh, sorry, of uh, Avidius Cassius, am I getting that right? Uh, and he, and he commanded cavalry there. He also, apart from holding a series of procuratorships in various provinces such as uh, Moesia Superior, Moesia Inferior. He also uh, was procurator of a, a Dacia Porolicensis. Uh, he was legate of no fewer than six legions, okay? So he was the legate of the second, uh, sorry, the first Adutrix Legion, followed by the second Adutrix Legion, then there was the 5th Macedonica Legion, the 1st Italica, the 13th Gemina, and then finally the 3rd Augusta. So uh, when I'm in reviewing this man's career, and uh, uh, just to give him a little difference you know, from uh, what was going on to, compared to Maximus, he had uh, quite a splendid career after Marcus Aurelius died, and he was held the consulship in 183. So it seems that he actually got along with uh, uh, Commodus, at least uh, to some degree, uh, he, uh, he he strikes me as being one of those figures where just a remarkable uh, general officer, maybe not the highest level of general officer, but if you're going to, if, if he had been a 
uh, a general in World War II, he would have been one of those uh, top-notch divisional commanders, such as like a, a James Gavin, who commanded the uh, 82nd Airborne in Market Garden in the Bulge uh, during the last year of the war. And that, but then you ask, well, why is this extraordinary man not mentioned in the historical source, at least the ones that we have? I'm thinking that one of the reasons he's d d is not mentioned is that most histories are at such a high level that you know they're they're looking at who is the commanders of the armies or or whatnot, and not quite you know who is the who's commander of the uh, the individual legions. And so this Marcus Valerius Maximianus has struck me for many uh, years as being such a, a close, uh, a clo uh, uh, so close in his the outlines of his career and all that he did for Maximus from the movie, and I, I just think he's a remarkable figure. But it's one of those it's one of those cases of well, why don't we get his career? Why didn't they make a movie of the actual person? Because that's fascinating and cinematic and all of that. You're like, oh man, but uh, you know. I, I would watch a movie called Marcus Valerius Maximianus is awesome. Okay, I would go see yeah, that movie. Yeah, 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 well, it yeah, hasn't got yeah. your main player really, has it? In the um, gladiator, the gladiator movie, that the main player really isn't uh, Maximus at all. It's the Colosseum. It's the the concept and the idea, and that is the big selling point as well. It's it's spect it's yeah set set piece spectacle. Uh, cinema, which again, which again goes back to, you know, sign of the cross, the original Quo Vadis and in, in uh, the pre World War Two Quo Vadis and things that that we're gonna we're gonna build this, you know, when you when when you're talking gladiatorial combat, when we're not talking gladiatorial combat, but you can go back to those twenties and thirties films and see them really trying to to make it, and it's you know then of course you get the Spartacus films, uh, and then of course you get the lovely 1980 Arena, um, the the sexploitation film, uh, and then 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 Gladiator, but um, you know and then a whole plethora of gladiatorial things since, which which are good and bad, but um, it's it's such a surprising sort of timeline of of, of material. Well, and that, uh, the you're... Gladiator combat's really the selling point because this started with that famous painting. Where you know, a thumbs down painting, that's what the author used to try to sell his screenplay is look at this painting. Can mm. you just imagine? And it all flows from there. So, yeah, this military career is fascinating. I think the comparison to like James Gavin is, is a good one, but that doesn't sell a movie. No, no. They made a movie called Patton, not Gavin. I've just been reading one of the Mary Beard books about uh, the Colosseum recently. And the first thing that she says in the book is that she brings up about the fact that, you know, up until a few years ago, you still had the Colosseum on the Olympic medals. And, you know, despite everything, it is such a recognisable symbol uh, across the world. You know, maybe not in terms of people actually really knowing in detail really what it is. Um, you know, in terms of the medal, uh, for instance, it's on there representing athletics. Um, and yet it's, you know... It, it's that symbol. Everybody knows what it is, apparently. And, um, yeah, you just can't get past that. And, of course, you know, put a couple of gladiators in there and say, yes, this is gladiator. This is, um, you know, what it was in terms of a fight, never mind the details. Um, and you've got your movie made. People are fascinated by gladiators, and every Hollywood movie has mm. a gladiator in it, even if the movie's not about gladiators, even if they have nothing to do with the plot. You look at a film like Centurion, and... The main character, played by Fassbender, happens to be the son of a gladiator. You look mm. at, you know, the um, the Eagle of the Ninth, which became the Eagle, and mm. you've got a guy who's helping our hero out, and he's a glad or was a gladiator. Yeah. First. lovely little scene, that. Yeah, it's just yeah. it's gladiator, gladiator, gladiator. If anyone knows anything about Rome, if you stop someone on the street and say, "Tell mm. me something about Rome," chances are they're going to say, "Well, you know, they had these gladiator battles, right?" You know. It's, it's like Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. We all know what she looks like. I show a picture to my grandson. He goes, that's Cleopatra. I said, how do you know that? Well, the way her, she's wearing her hair. Mm -hmm. People just, it, it becomes endemic. And so, yes, with mm -hmm. Rome, it's, it's gladiators for good or bad. The details are irrelevant. They have no idea that these battles were very rigidly controlled and there was yeah. a formula to mm -hmm. them and ceremonies. It, they just thought you put two guys in there and said, fight. You can imagine how that would have gone down at the pitching meeting. You know, uh, we're going to do this for real, so um, we need an arbiter in there with a big stick, and he's going to stop the fight any time anybody, you know, doesn't fight cleanly. And, uh, you know, that, no, no, that's not going to work. I'm sorry. It's, 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 the, it's, it's uh, you know, for lack of a better word, it's the Western white hat, black hat um, 
portrayal of villainy because you know there were strict rules about about fair play and balance and a fair fight and you know if someone fought well then both parties would live the whole idea that you know you're going to lose 50 percent of your investment every time you play is like well no one would play that sport um and i I mean the same thing i'm I'm doing some some research on jousting films and jousting films are the same jousting was all about honor and being seen to be honorable and yet in all of the jousting films someone's cheating you're like well that's not how jousting worked someone didn't cheat that you know even even the bad guy was an honorable knight and if, if, if there was even a, a whiff that they were being dishonourable, it would have been all over. So, but that plays into our good guy, bad guy, social justice, all of those things that we take for granted in, in filmic portrayals of, uh, of villainy and heroism. Can I just um, say, um, actually, I found it, you know, just jumping into my mind here, it's interesting to think that they can't deal with these details, you know, for a film like Gladiator. But, um, you know, from lots of my students read the Roman Mysteries books by Caroline Lawrence. And in those books, aimed at kids, she goes into more detail in terms of how a gladiator uh, contest is run. More honesty in terms of, you know, the absolute horror of some of the um, criminal punishments at lunchtime entertainments. Um, you yeah, know, how the bestiarii worked and whatnot, it's... It, it's really a bit of a put me down for um, you know the adults of you know you can't deal with this, but the kids can actually. But um... well, I think I think it's because you're dealing with with levels of of uh, producer who are like, oh no, that won't interest anyone. No, oh they don't want to. No, no, that's not how it happened. Do it this way. You're like, oh my god. And I think that comes back to the historical consultant learning to to let go and and accept the paycheck. Um, you also need too much exposition to explain to a public who has no idea what's going on, which kind of takes you out the film. Well, what's going on here is it, it'll all get cut. We need a Dan Brown gladiatorial film. So while we're running through the streets of of Rome, we can get exposition from from Tom Hanks on how gladiatorial combat was fought whilst he's talking to a pretty young woman and we'd be fine. Well, it wouldn't quite have worked very well with uh, Russell Crowe whispering we, away no. something under his breath <laughs> about some guy with a stick who's now the referee. And what's the referee going to yeah, do? And he's yeah, here exactly, because of this, exactly. that, the reason. You need, you need gladiatorial mysteries that only Dan Brown can solve. And then, look, look I, I might pitch that, that bam. And what would we call it? Colosseum. Yeah, done. Done. There's actually, there's actually an Illuminati... There's actually an Illuminati mystery in the design of the Colosseum itself, in the number of the arches, in the, uh, in the labyrinthine pattern. Ah, oh, look, it's all... I, I, when he sees this, don't be surprised if the next Dan Brown novel is called Colosseum. So should we look at the open? Should we get to the opening, uh, the opening battle scene, um, of which one comment on Facebook was... Uh, I, 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 I've just noted it was a comment to possibly save blushes. It especially seems perverse to try and get the costumes so right and the tactics so wrong in that opening battle scene. Well, I think, I think sniggering. you'd have people. Well, you'd have people who say costumes so right because they're not. Um, you know the 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 English Civil War helmets and the you know the banded armor that sort of goes two steps too far. Um, in comparison to what we know of Lorica Segmentata, um, you know, uh, there's so many. There are the funny thing is, if you pause that opening battle scene moment, you would spend longer than the film discussing discussing what's actually wrong with it. But in terms of they got that wrong, they got that wrong, they got that wrong. Oh my god, they got that wrong. Oh, let's not even start when they all call out Roma Victor. Um, and you know, well, who who deploys cavalry in woods? What what's going on? You know, uh, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but or from a different angle. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but army. I think, but I think the the funny thing is, so how wrong are the costumes? How wrong is that armor? One, it, you it should not a... have. Uh, even at that stage, there would not be the uniformity in, in any army uh, that the Romans put out there. I mean, throughout, they seem to always have a variety of different. You know, you never have a pure lorica segmentata. Um, you know army you're not going to have uh, everybody wearing lorica, lorica hamata at the same time either it's um you need a little bit of a you know mix and match of helmets as well the, i think the shields are more you know the only thing that really is uh arguably 
um, to a certain extent, um, something that might be uniform, but um, at the same time, it's you know, again, we sort of get references by Tacitus to the, um, you know, even the shields being, uh, you know, not conforming in terms of the German legions. So, you know, it, that's only to start, that's not even looking at the uniform, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's, there's a, you know, it's basically almost as if they've taken the Trajan's column for their uniform inspiration uh, and gone, well, this is what we'll do. And, and that whole idea that it's 80 years out of date and that there's even problems with the 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 column as a way of depicting you know the column of marcus aurelius would have been a better uh column to look at which is you know just just around the corner in rome it's not far um and that that shows a much more you know again it's still artistic but it's a better depiction of what what um roman forces would have looked like at the time maybe it's a shorter list what did they get right Hmm. uh (laughs) they get close at they get closer than any other film has got to being oh. right. And to, I feel, I mean, it's... I watched, I watched the 1936 Scipio Africanus film. That's actually quite remarkably accurate. But again, no one, no one, no one watches that and no one's seen it since. But, uh, um, okay, but, that's why my comment. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. But, um, but, but I, think, I, think, I think you're right. I, I think all of these come with the caveat that it captured... A f- it captured a feel and it captured an imagination of a, of a generation. So, so it, ha- can't, it has can't... you sitting there, basically thinking, "Oh, you were on the right track. Please yeah. keep going." Yeah, but yeah. they don't. I think the so. only the only thing that I look at in that film and go, "Oh, that's good," are the gladiuses, which uh, one where he cuts the guy's head off and leaves it hanging in a tree, which isn't right, and then the next one. Because of course they were a stabbing weapon, not a blade. But anyway, um, and then he grabs, and then he draws another one, and they're like, "Oh, those are those are nice gladiuses." But you're like, "Okay, but the gladius is not a cavalry sword; it's an infantry sword." Um, and then you come back and you see the the line advancing with couched peeler, and you're like, "Well, peeler are throwing. You know, you've even got them accurately made. They're a throwing weapon. You're not going to meet a charge with them like a couched lance. You would have thrown them." Oh gosh, and then you would have drawn your gladius, but none of you are using. Oh, oh. Anyway, so yeah, I've got, I've got a thing. I have a theory about that, though. I have a theory about that. If you watch it, it's seen, and then they don't seem to be seen again. So I wonder if you didn't see it being thrown, then there's a sort of a suspension of disbelief where there's a moment where they're thrown because uh, they are not. I don't, I don't no, recall no, we, them seen we, seen again. We see them, but they're definitely there. They're lined up and they're yeah, sat there no, with them. You do, the, you do of, see them in the ground though, as well. And when the Germans at the end, at the end of the battle. Yeah, but when the Germans some when the German, when the Germans charge their line, they're still carrying them, um, which which would have been the the greatest faux pas of of Roman generalship ever imagined. Um, but uh, um, yeah, it's it's just a. But again, you know, in this day and age of again, why why do they do it in 1936? It's like because they don't have OH and S. They don't care about throwing missiles at people and you know get out of the way. Whereas today, you know, your your extras are, you know, you're up for all sorts of lawsuits if you're throwing missiles at them. And again, I remember with um, with uh, Braveheart, they were they went long and hard into the to the air cannon that they used with the um the arrows coming down into their shields to to make it show that it was safe and you know all of those sorts of things which brings us to something else uh, uh, martin on facebook points out that um you know the romans sort of do sort of march up in sort of uh, in, in in some nice fo- sort of formation marching there and you know they take into account the rough terrain and it's all very good um but then suddenly they're 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 charged, and uh, what, what happens to the f- famous, uh, you know, meat grinder? They kind of it just it collapses into this melee, um, which I, I suspect you know the, 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 the Romans prepared to fight melee battles. It's not really, you know, not really what they're known for. So when we, with this idea where where well it fits into the idea of does the gladius and. So is it you know why is the that bat that bat that battle scene um, not fitting into necessarily the idea of what people might have of you know them sat behind the shields with the gladius you know prodding people with this famous meat grinder type. I think, I think there is of more that. of a um, an acceptance these days. I think it, it, for a long time it's been the accepted view that you go with the textbooks and what they say about the Romans going in with their formation and keeping their formation. Um, you know, and and as you say, 
sit and stab, basically. Uh, and I think looking at some evidence, like for example Trajan's Column, uh, when you look at some of the poses that some of the soldiers are taking on that, that there was more of the you know broken formation fighting going on in Roman battles than a lot of textbooks have actually given credit for in the past. So I mean, on that on that front, I think it's not that bad that they're showing it. But on the other hand, it is a bit broken up in terms of how it develops from the initial formations to get to that. I don't think it'll be that quick, really. And I think I think every every film that's shown Rome for me, you go back to Spartacus, it all devolves to a melee where it's one-on-ones. You know, every every Roman film does that. Um, a, I think because that's what we, you know, the and in a film called Gladiator, one-on-one combat's much more epic and heroic. And so we see Russell Crowe's character fighting, you know, these great hulking Germans and there's blood and there's gore and there's, you know, uh, lots of sharp blades chopping limbs off um but i think so therefore you get the sense of you know i mean he's also mounted he's a cavalry he's leading from the front uh in a cavalry charge in the one you know in the in the second century it's like well that that didn't really happen uh and he's did that happen at all well i can't recall really any time be it early or late that you'd have a commander on on horseback actually leading a charge like that exactly and i mean alexander it's the it's the alexander technique okay, yeah but, but then yeah. um it's also the only time you find a roman commander on foot going into the front line is an exceptional circumstance and you know we get stories of sulla and of of caesar doing it and they're they're told off for doing it because they're jeopardizing themselves and they're, they're putting themselves in danger but it's also to motivate their troops so leading from the front in that regard is very filmic um and seeing him on the ground fighting it amongst his own troops and you know the 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 craze of battle where he almost stabs one of his own com- compatriots is very very vietnam um very 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 platoon-esque um but again i think it's a sh- it's a shorthand of 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 the face of battle um that film audiences understand whereas the in a way, the dehumanising stab, 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 stab would almost harken back to Battleship Potemkin, you know, where the the, the Russian forces to put down the um, the the protesters are dehumanised in their their sort of automaton tactic. Well, it also it also by showing Russell Crowe fighting this way in the first battle, it sets up the story so that when he becomes a gladiator, his transition from Roman soldier general to gladiator seems awfully quick, but we accept it because, hey, we just saw him doing essentially all this. So when he comes out into the arena and suddenly takes all these gladiators down, we're not surprised because look at all those Germans he massacred in in instance, right? And then the same way. It, It works in reverse as well because, of course, he takes command at the Battle of Cannae, the the most you know, bizarrely inaccurate Battle of Cannae ever with chariots and women and, you know, and, and, oh, but, but, you know, when he starts to, and we even get that reiterated that there's one gladiator who says, well, no, I'm not going to listen to you. What do you know? I know better. And he gets cut down. And so all of the other gladiators suddenly realize the authority of their, this general who we as the audience know is a general, but none of them do because he hasn't given them any information about him because, you know, you you know, again, back to uh, Spartacus, you know, you don't want to talk to me, you don't want to know me, I may have to kill you. Good old Woody Strode's beautiful line. Um, and, um, you know, it, 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 I think the funny thing is there's so much shorthand in in these films that we understand. Um, well, general, for a start, we keep referring to a general. What what rank is a general? It might actually, we're referring to, it could be a, a relatively low commander who could be in the field, because let's face it, the emperor is behind him watching. Yeah, exactly, his, exactly. His, uh, where he is in the command structure isn't actually pointed no. out. He's just referred to as well, a general. No, nice, just then... It's just a way of saying high ranking because the, the term means nothing. Well, decurion, basically. I think he would be a decurion if he was commanding cavalry in person. Ooh. Which makes but him then, quite but, low. Quite low he ranking. Shouldn't, he shouldn't be, have anything to do with the infantry then at all. He shouldn't be in there at the start indicating where, you know, organizing who's going to give the signal to whom so i say we go with uh legate that's he was a commander of a legion there or something like that that makes the most sense and 
Yes, but in that case, how many legions are we supposed to ind indicate are actually at this battle? That's a... Well, interestingly, you know, if this was a battle that was fought sometime during the Marcomannic Wars, uh, it, it seems that that large battles. Uh, as we would understand the Romans fighting were relatively few during the Northern Wars and that it, it was much more of, it was campaigning in which they were fighting probably smallish groups of German tribesmen and going with smaller detachments, maybe of legionary size, maybe even smaller and uh, rooting them out from wherever they were. Much of these wars were actually taking place on or at least some of them on Roman soil. That is, they were either they were repelling invasions too. Uh, I think that the Marcomanni may have gotten as far as northern Italy. That's how far south they got. So uh, it, it never, uh, after that, after they had been cleared out, they then went and were conducting uh, operations north of the Danube. And Marcus Aurelius himself was spending most of his time in uh, frontier towns along the Danube. And that's where he wrote his uh, meditations. One was at Carnuntum. Another one was at at uh, the Granua, I think they said. So you can imagine that, that these were uh, expeditionary forces going across fighting Germans and that it, it, it took a while for them to, um, to stamp the, down this, these, you know, put down these attacks sufficiently to, you know, call it a victory. But it's certainly not really depicted on an epic scale that necessary that say, um, uh, Braveheart is, on an epic scale, you know, they do that whole famous line with thousands of short soldiers. And it, it actually does come across as a, as quite a compressed, small scale, uh, yeah, almost like a large I think, skirmish. I think if you were, yeah, if you're looking at the numbers, um, you're looking at a legion or less in terms of how many troops he's got. Um, but then you're going, well, would your, would your, uh, emperor be present at such a small skirmish in which case, but, um, uh, you know, or just checking checking up on what how the conduct of the war is going whilst I unwarlike go and write my philosophical meditation book. So, um, um, Alejandro, yeah. one of our Patreon supporters, thank you very much, um, asks... <laughs> asks... Um, Hello, Alejandro. Sorry, I've got the wrong question suddenly. Asks, um, is there much support for the use of catapults as anti-personnel weapons? <laughs> oh, I... I, there is certainly a lot of artillery there. There is, and I think I think it's again it, it's one of those shorthand things. Battles have explosions, therefore, even though even though you're in the middle of the, you've got to have flaming arrows. You're like, why would you have flaming arrows if you're not actually trying to burn houses down in a siege? And you know these exploding um, containers, amphorae of, of of oil, is very modern battle explosions it's loud um it's exciting and it's visually yeah wow but yeah very unlikely to have ever happened um just a waste of resources really and another a query from from uh from, from angus on patreon not me but uh, uh <laughs> archers uh seem to have been used pretty commonly across the empire uh, but how common would they have been in the legions stationed on the German frontier? And would they have the lux luxury of powder monkeys uh, that they have in the film who carry them fresh arrows? It depends on who your auxiliaries are that are attached to that legion. I mean, every every group of auxiliaries are bringing their own skills and their own, um, you know, own retainers, if you like, with them as well. Um, you know, if, if their goals, then... Um, you might have something in terms of how you have it. some of the early Gauls when they turn up with their cavalry. You know, you have it for every you know two Gauls, you have a backup uh, man with the the extra horses. Um, it, it all depends on yeah where you're getting your auxiliaries from. You know what they're trained in and how long they've been serving with you. And I think also the the fact that the the archers and are dressed as legionaries. Um, you know, they're they're very impractically clothed for uh, uh, archers oh, 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 uh, um, the archers in chainmail they're, they're kind of heavily armoured archers in that respect I, I think uh, archers in anything would be heavily armed well yeah <laughs> they're not in the uh, you know they're, they're not quite the same look as the uh, as the uh, legionary because I because I, 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 I thought the same thing on that and then I went back and watched it and I thought oh no they've, they've put them in chainmail so there's kind of heavily armoured archers which sort of slightly baffle me but 
Lorica Hamata's is even more expensive, though, isn't it? Why would you? you it's going to be a very rich archer who can afford a set of chain mail. Would archers presumably have been out in front and then retreated through or on the flanks rather than necessarily behind, behind the front line? Well, I think Mark makes the point that Al, uh, uh, no, sorry, was it uh, Arian? Yeah, the point about Arian. Arian, yes. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, um, about the the expedition against the Allens, um, and he has a he has a formation how he talks about this is how you defeat. But again, that's that's aimed at horse archer enemies, mainly mounted enemies. But um, but yeah, there, there is the idea there that you put your archers behind your uh, your legionaries, and you defeat them with an ineffable amount of spots. Yeah, I, I have some questions as to exactly how I'm, I'm going to use small unit actions in quotes if this is still a legionary sized battle group we're looking at. I, I But I do have some questions as to how what kind of tactics uh, a legion might have used uh, in a battle over the frontiers as opposed to if you were bringing maybe 30,000 men into combat. And you know we're going fighting a more conventional battle as we understand that. Uh, in, in these situations where it was somewhere, you know, maybe bigger than a skirmish, but not quite the, the at the level of a full army sized battle. Uh, I, I wonder if tactics might the Romans that the tactics that the Romans employed might have changed depending upon the opponent that they were facing. Uh, they, they could easily have seen that, depending on what enemy they were fighting, uh, backing up their uh, legionaries with some uh, archery firepower, I'll, I'll say, uh, would have made some sense. And that's why I think Aryan might have chosen to use that, uh, you, know, you know, back up their lines. I think one of the things we don't, uh, especially in film, get is the sense that the one of the reasons for Rome's great success militarily was its flexibility of the legion as a as a unit, um, but also its ability to absorb and adapt other people's tactics for their own purposes, um, and that, that you know that they were they were encouraged and had had done so and continued to do so as opposed to we've now become a military machine. This is the only way the machine runs. Um, that's it. Um, right. Well, it's often it, it, sometimes it's uh, said that you know the Roman legions declined from the days of the early. And uh, I'll say Middle Empire, which is would have been about the second century BC, uh, they declined during the late Empire. But in fact, uh, while it's true that the Roman you know, infantry may not have been quite as dominant as they were in the early centuries of the Empire, the Roman army had to change because their opponents changed. They needed uh, more cavalry. They needed to adopt some you know, heavy cavalry, such as the cataphracts. They needed to uh, the, these uh, new. And they, then they were always adopting new weapons and tactics depending on who they were fighting uh the 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 pylum uh, you know wonderful weapon and 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 whatnot but uh as they started encountering more opponents uh you know heavy cavalry such as the sarmatians uh for example or the parthians or the sassanids uh the infantry needed a longer weapon to uh hold them off you know the pila you know was a throwing weapon not very efficient at stabbing though and the gladius was a sword armed uh, roman legionaries with gladius were just not enough to maybe you know keep the enemy cavalry from prevent uh, penetrating their lines well by this stage the gladius is starting to grow in length again though i mean it, it, gone are the days of the short gladius i mean that's the early empire right. becoming more like the spatha right yeah in length yes yes and, and and i don't think the romans would have necessarily have seen their army because they made these changes being some uh deterioration uh you know i mean if, if you're going to say like you know the was there a was the late Roman Empire weaker and the army weaker than that of the early Empire? You might say yes, but I don't think it was because of the tactics. I think it had more to do with, well, they had a lot more enemies to deal with. It seems they also, uh, you know, politically were just not as stable in the late Empire, and that probably hurt them far more than anything else that happened. Another question. It's a long one. I'll pick the piece of paper up. Um, some lines which have always stood out for me are the ones just before battle where Maximus is rallying his men and tells them that if they find themselves riding in the green fields with the sun in their faces, they shouldn't be troubled because they are already in Elysium. Um, 
Is this a realistic calming of nerves? Might it have happened? How deep would a belief in Elysium be, etc.? Now, we've sort of touched upon, uh, you know, giving giving your troops a pep talk before and how actually before battle they probably couldn't hear a thing. Um, and with the famous whisperer, Russell Crowe, they probably couldn't hear beyond the end of his horse. Uh, but let's give him the, the benefit of the doubt in that respect and say they could all hear him. It wasn't necessarily a lot of troops he was talking to. Well, well he does actually he does actually raise his voice in that one. He is actually called, he is declaiming. It's quite, it's, it's much more contrasted to how he talks in the Colosseum. Um, the pep talk's actually not too bad um, in terms of, in terms of delivery. It follows the tradition of the likes of Tacitus in terms of, uh, you know, the belief that every battle you have to have a um, you know, your standard pep talk, and that will be recorded by the historians. And in the words of Thucydides, if I don't don't actually get the exact words right, I'll make up what they were supposed to have said anyway. Um, and I mean, that's you know just adhering to the the tradition of the Roman historian. Even more recently, when um, Lucius Verus writes a letter to uh, Marcus Cornelius Fronto about the the Parthian War, he you know gives him a note, um, and he even says, you know, not that I want to say it, the student to the master, but make sure in your history of my wars, my glorious wars, you include my harangues to the army, which I've sent you the text of. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, you know that certainly happened, whether it was orchestrated or, or rehearsed. <laughs> At the same time, in terms of the religion, um, that's going to be a little bit of a problem because the more and more we find out about Roman society, the more we realise that it's a really you know mixed bunch in terms of religious beliefs, be they um, in terms of the traditional uh, religion of Rome, you know the extent to which people believed in the gods and actually pr practised, and you know to the extent of you know Cicero probably being an atheist. Um, in the way that he cast doubt upon it. Um, and in addition, you know, if we're talking about a Roman army of that period, then, you know, take, for example, the legionaries are going to be drawn from across the empire. And so you've got your regional, you know, religions. If you've got, you know, you've got your Britons who have got their, you know, dwelling on Celtic beliefs, you've got uh, maybe some, you know, uh, I don't know, you've probably got some Jews in there from the, you know, it's a whole range of different religion, um, you know, not, and that's just amongst the legionaries, let alone your auxiliaries. Um, and of course, the cavalry are going to be the auxiliaries. So therefore, if he's speaking about um, Elysium, then, yeah. And then Elysium, if you want to get into that problem, Elysium is only, it, it's, it's not even a standard element in the Roman religion itself. It's only something that comes in. <laughs> Sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. I think it's. I think it's. I think it's. Again, it's the. It's the short. It's the shorthand. At least they did paganism. Um, I think if you were going to to choose one, though, it should have been something to do with the Mithras cult, which at least we know from the surviving Hadrian's Wall. Um, you know that that was a widespread belief amongst soldiers. Well, it's such a, it is such a recurring theme throughout the film. Is is the is the idea. The religious idea. Yeah, but I think I mean I think it would be a personal thing. You wouldn't then put it out and say that you all believe my religion. Again, I think that's a very Christian uh, later idea that we're all of one faith. Ah, but he's only talking to like, the cavalry. Well, and the, you know where the cavalry are from. They could yeah, be yeah. from from yeah, yeah but, from Spain. Well, <laughs> it flies in the face of what Pliny says as well. Pliny, um, when he asks the advice of Trajan for. Um, you know, what should I do about the Christians? You've got the famous letter saying, you know, they should, um, uh, you know, adhere to, you know, recognise our uh, state beliefs, but on the other hand, not interfere with the other people's religions. So There's a, there's a great so. line in Spartacus where, where um, Gracchus and uh, Julius Caesar are leaving the Senate and Gracchus decides to make a sacrifice. He says, come on, let's make a good old fashioned sacrifice. And Julius Caesar says, I'm surprised I didn't think you believed in the gods. He goes, privately, I don't believe in any of them. Neither do you. Publicly, I believe in all of them, and so should you. You know, and I yeah. thought, yeah. And, of course, that was Dalton Trumbo writing something that, again, was geared yeah. very much to 1960s America. Yeah, but I think it's got it's got a bit of legs to it, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, and well, Caesar was a priest by that point. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, the way he, li he uses religion is, you know, it's, it's very mm -hmm. well tied into his po political Ex themes, so... Ex expedient, shall we say. 
look, it sounds right and it makes a lot of sense. And there's the whole, you know, uh, th- throughout the film, there's the running your hand over corn or grass or or dirt or soil, um, which is it, it gives it a thematic tie-in, but and it feels right. But when you start to look deeper, it's like oh, it's it's you know, it's like a sieve. It's got all sorts of holes. Again, in it. there's um, that element of you know. Uh, a, ta- a real little tease when he's uh, shown, you know, collecting up his little, uh, the little figures of his ancestral gods and whatnot, and that's not got in- gone into. But you know, you sort of think that's sort of going more down the right line in terms of personal beliefs and whatnot. But again, it's just it's something that just passes and isn't given its due, really. Well, you can only ever get so. <laughs> You get it so much, you know, we get into Basil Exposition again, don't we? Uh, and it all gets, we get carried away. Um, Stephanie from Facebook pointed something, asked something, which afterwards I thought, oh, that's a in- peculiarly interesting question. Um, is there evidence for the Romans using war dogs, uh, either uh, domesticated or semi-domesticated? Because uh, Maximus does have his, 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 uh, his, his German shepherd dog bounding along with him. But isn't isn't the dogs didn't isn't there a isn't there, I think there's a meme somewhere that the dog's name is War, because there's the line at my command unleash unleash hell no unleash hell and then the next thing you see is the dog bounding so I think there was a there was a thing saying the dogs <laughs> the dog's name is hell. Um, um, the Romans yeah. did have a mastiff of some sort. That is, there was a breed which today we call a mastiff. Now I don't know if that breed survives in a recognizable form, but they did use dogs. I don't know if they use dogs in wartime uh, in the sense of like, uh, like fighting alongside their troops in a pitched battle. Uh, I mean, it, it strikes me as being as though there's dogs are useful uh, for in a variety of roles for an army, uh, not necessarily to accompany a master, you know, beside his horse. It's not what you think because there is actually a study that's just been finished last year and then they um, released their findings at a talk at the British Museum uh, about six months ago. And they, they've basically been looking at the bones of all the dogs' uh, burials at the forts around, uh, in particular, they started at Hadrian's Wall forts. And then they sort of expanded it to look at a couple of sites down in the West Country. And they have come out with the idea that actually the do- type of dogs that they were mostly found in Roman army forts and camps in Britannia were actually lap dogs, little little lap dogs, and not only that, but they've also come out with evidence to say that they were skinning them after they died, not necessarily killing them to skin them, but um, skinning them after they died, and then uh, you know using the using the pelts, so being economical about it. Battle battle chihuahua. Yeah, so that would be cool. So mm. it, it's an mm. interesting. It's you know, it's not what yeah. you sort of think. Yeah, little you yeah, know, yeah. terrier type things basically. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I think there's also again as a shorthand of a man and his dog. Um, there's a there's a western you know man and his horse kind of thing going on in Gladiator. All of those. He's sort of you know he's the he's he's he, every generation of film goers every man because he does everything. Um, if terriers are the kind of dogs that they would have had, you know, along Hadrian's Wall, I'm just wondering. That doesn't strike me as an animal that they're bringing into uh, to battle, but I'm wondering on on a practical level. You, you, you've got a fort or something like that, and I mean, what do you have inside the fort? You've probably got some food stores and whatnot. Were the were the terriers being used as rattlers? Uh, you think that that might actually have been? they've come up with absolute that event. That evidence. They've actually looked at the Horea on Hadrian's Wall, and if you have a look at uh, Housestead's Fort in particular, the Horea actually have on the outside there are holes down at ground level that are big enough for a terrier to get through. And so they're basically saying they, they were being used as ratters underneath the Horea in the ca- in the camps as one thing. So at least so. Well, that's what they, they're good. They're good at it. So. Mm. In what is, I think, uh, uh, an interesting comment with one of our uh, supporters on Patreon, if you're not a supporter on Patreon, please become a supporter on Patreon, um, points out, and th- this this I thought, well, it was good in reflection of the film. Does it, does it bother anyone that, that when the cavalry are using stirrups uh, when they wouldn't have yet reached Europe? 
I think that for safety's sake, you would have had to have had those extras use stirrups. I, I can only imagine it would have been much more difficult to try and, well, first to find someone who could ride passably well safely, and then to do that with one of those uh, high back stirrups that they used during uh, the the ancient times. Uh, probably just finding a rider who could use a stirrup, you, you had to make that sort of concession. Uh, to... Curi- curiously, when I looked, it turns out that's what happened. <laughs> they, 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 but I, but it, got, it then set me thinking. You know, we have historical inaccuracies. Perhaps they're knowingly done because that's the only way to get the thing done. You've just got to live with some of these things. I think in um, uh, Alexander the Great, the Oliver Stone, I think they do a much better job of at least disguising. The fact that they're using stirrups, um, I think there's a there's a much better, more accurate sort of non stirrup riding kind of thing going on there. But then they had Robin Lane Fox who could do it because he was he was he was in his own costume, you know, just behind Alexander to the left and was riding bareback, as far as I understand, or well, not bareback, but um, without stirrups. Right. And so then the the lead actor felt, well, if he can do it, I. Of course, yeah, this digital yeah. age. Um, Painting out the stirrups digitally would not be impossible. It's not cheap, mm. but it is something you could do if you weren't doing a massive scene, if you just had a couple of riders going by. Because, yes, safety is critical. You can't afford to have your star fall off his horse and break his neck. Does he use them in the scene, in the scenes where he's actually, you know, after he, es- he makes his escape and he's off to Spain, does he use them then? Well, I don't remember. That's a good question. No. I don't know. I don't know that he does. You might right. be right. You might be right. When there, when there is just him by himself, I, I've got a feeling that it, yeah. I think, I think yeah. more troublesome than the than the stirrups, though, from a historical standpoint, are how the Praetorians are dressed in that black armor, that that uh, Waffen SS armor. I'm just. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. yeah, yeah. But see again that that's. That's just borrowed directly from the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, that that black armor. Uh, but they, there's a, there's a do... curious loop in this, though, because there's some connect uh, some connection to basing something on Lenny Riefenstahl, but at the same time, that in itself is kind of all been circular because that's sort of looping back into the, the Nazism of of that time. So you get that that strange. Uh, transposition of a perfect storm of Lenny Riefenstahl, Nuremberg, you know, the Olympic, the whole thing. And then, then you go, well, that's uniforms are black. There's this great black. book. Um, let me see if I can hold it up here to the camera. Gladiator Film and History. Right. You guys have probably seen this, maybe you've read it even. This is uh, oh. Martin uh, Winkler, is the uh, editor. They have an S. Ta da! Yeah, they have an essay on that very thought about the fascism in mm. uh, the film as a model for Rome, for fascist Rome, whether Rome is yep. fascist or not, you know, it's irrelevant. The film, Roman, you know, the Hollywood Romans definitely are fascist. <coughs> and we see that theme played out in lots of films. That's almost, again, yep. shorthand we're talking about, right? And not just the salutes, but the, the use of flags. If you look at the uh, TV series, Rome, right? There are all these red flags with black eagles on them all over the place. Did the Romans really have those? Well, that kind of stuff doesn't survive uh, over time that well. So, but they look good, you know. They they, they yeah. tell us what we yeah. want to know about the Romans. Caesar was a fascist, you know. That's what it tells us. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think there was nineteen sixty nine's Alfred the Great. The Vikings are in black armor and march in step. So, so it's a, this just this bizarre, um, you know. That's that's how we deal with them. It did occur to me if the Romans made the film themselves about themselves, how accurate would they be? <laughs> would they well, make some of the mistakes for their own reasons, for similar well, reasons? Trajan's column, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, and then there's all sorts of arguments about the accuracy or or the, you know, the eyewitnessness of that uh, media. And there are, I mean, there are other monuments which are the same, and of course they are doing propaganda and and all sorts of stuff at the same time. Um, yeah. Has there any ever been a, ba- a a film about war that has been especially accurate in depicting combat? Because I'm thinking about all of the World War II movies I've ever seen, and apart from maybe a handful 
here and there, especially in the last couple of decades. Uh, there is such a thing as you know World War II movie combat, which is, is just not what it was, you know. And and partly they do that for the sake of the dramatic narrative. You have to have your characters near each other to talk. They have to be able to hear each other, and which they probably could not have done at all in you know in if the combat was intense. And and I also wonder whether or not combat was necessarily as intense as I see it. So when you see these battles going back to say Roman times, and how would the, would the Romans have have done it? Uh, probably they would have uh, done it in such a fashion as to uh, allow their main characters to uh, give speeches to each other about the the what the greatness of Rome and why they're fighting and dying for the glory of Rome. That would take about twenty minutes, uh, which they would not have had that time to do. <laughs> You get that you get that curious idea though of the Second World War when people refer to oh actually most of it's not doing anything most people do nothing and there's a long periods of doing nothing and that Terence Malick film is great because it's three hours of nothing much happening and about five minutes of combat um, but but if you and uh, is there a point about if you're looking at the ancient world you look at your frontage and you look at how many men you have and then you have look look at how long the battle lasted supposedly. Uh, he did some maths. Surely, a lot of men will be doing not a lot for a lot of the time. I agree. Uh, it, there's there's a, a theory, at least. Now, I call all of these things theories because uh, no one has ever seen uh, an actual battle in the ancient world. So we have to reconstruct it from what we read and also what we can conjecture based on how these weapons worked. But it would seem that in, in most battles there would have been a lot of staring at each other. Uh, not all people would have been engaged at the same time and certainly not equally people in the rear ranks would not be fighting uh, the enemy directly and that uh, there was probably such a thing as what they call it combat pulses in which there would be fighting uh, but men can't really sustain uh, the exertions of, of direct combat uh, for a very long time, they would have needed a rest. They maybe, and that's when possibly they would have, you know, replaced the the, the winded, exhausted soldiers with maybe fresh troops drawn from just right behind them. Uh, I'm thinking also just going back a bit, but you know, in the Roman Republic, they would deploy their troops in a checkerboard pattern, and uh, certainly if they're deployed in several lines. Uh, and, you know, sort of like with one unit, uh, empty space, a unit next to it, and so on and so on, uh, any troops further back would not probably be directly in combat, at least not at the same time. Um, whether or not they closed up their lines afterwards remains to be seen. But uh, it, it would seem to me that uh, in most circumstances, the, the battle would be fought and the, anybody in the rear ranks was not directly engaged. I think filmically the most accurate. I mean, there's some some wonderful things with Alexander the Great. I don't think they're they're close enough together, um, weirdly. Uh, but the the best one for me is the the film of of Alatriste, which is a pike phalanx from the 17th century. But the the way that they show how combat in a pike phalanx from the 17th century operates, I think, is says a lot for how close formation should should be shown. Um, but yeah, most most of them are. Most of them are, you know, from a, as far as our theories go, you, you're not getting any sense of how it actually happened. But filmically, you're getting a great sort of sense of what it was like to be in battle. Well, when uh, George Stevens, the director, returned from World War II, and most of these directors had gone over and made films uh, with the armies, he um, one thing that impressed him about war is that it was very loud. It was much louder than he'd imagined it was. So when he made the movie Shane, he purposely made all the gunfights incredibly loud. He boosted the audio for that way above the audio in the rest of the film, just so it would have that visceral shock to the audience. Wow, you know, this is very, you know, mm. this gunfire is very loud. Now, when he goes to a, 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 a screening of it before it's released, the film projectionist comes down, recognizes him. George Stevens was already famous at this point, and says, "Oh, Mr. Stevens, love your movie Shane. I, I, I saw there was a problem with the audio. Don't worry, I corrected it." And what he had done is he'd gone through and, and adjusted the audio levels so it was now all the same level. And he was up there writing the levels on the on the board to make sure that everything was at the same level. Of course, defeating exactly what George Stevens had tried to do. Um, and so this idea that that these guys are talking to each other over the din of battle um, 
yeah, probably not. Particularly not in modern war where everything's much, much, much louder. We get the comments about how silent ancient battle is. And again, that's, there's an argument about it. But, you know, the desolation of silence and the, the, the Spartans walking into battle in, in silence and how that was scarier than, than the, the cheering and the yelling that you would get. And, of course, the, the music that would accompany um, ancient, ancient battle. We don't, you don't get that. You know, you get the soundtrack. Um, but you don't get the you don't get the the flutes or the or the pipes or and you often get oh, the Zulu cheers. Well, the Zulu cheers, of course, it's like oh, I need I need a I need a, a barbarian, I, I need a barbarian sounding horde. Well, here's one from Southern Africa. Um, you know, it's a pity we don't get Welsh hymns. You know, we could sing Men of Harlech <laughs> back at them, and it would it would be Men of Harlech. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I think that there's all sorts of things missing that we know are there, like the the introduction of of uh, percussion. You're like, well, actually, we've got no evidence of drums. You know, drums are a 19th century military thing, but because of the the ubiquity of of that 19th century uniform drummer boy kind of thing, that's what we get. We get uniformed serried ranks of legionaries marching like the thin red line um, with drums. And you're like, well, hang on, we didn't. We've got trumpets, uh, no drums, no one. There's no drum. What are you doing? But yeah, there's such a shorthand, you know, the de- you know the length of this podcast, we're not even touching on the surface, and yet the documentary you would need to show your film goers of like, well, here's what we know, uh, is going to be an eight-hour doco, and then you show them the film, which is historically accurate, and then everyone goes, well, that was dissatisfying, because it, w- it didn't fit with any of my preconceptions of what I should be seeing. So we're... Really, yeah, it, was a bit, it wasn't very Percy. Yeah. And we're, we're really stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place. Daryl F. Zanuck once said, there's nothing uh, more boring than being accurate but not dramatic on screen, mm. which for <laughs> Zanuck is a, is a bit of an irony because he's the one that was behind The Longest Day, which is probably one of the more accurate depictions of the D-Day landings. But it's not one of the favorite films of the D-Day landings. Everyone loves Private Ryan or, or some other film. And, and that speaks to this point of, okay, here's the eight hours of history. Now here's the film. And everyone goes, well, oh, yeah, so that's not all that, you know. Well, the the longest day almost plays out in real time. It's that long and drawn out. Yeah, <laughs> they said longest movie. They weren't kidding. Yeah, and yet, and yet, part of that though also, and this speaks again to this idea of time and place. That film was made about twenty less than twenty years after the end of the war. So most of the people that had fought in World War Two and survived that were still alive. And when they went to this film, what they wanted to see was something they weren't familiar with, which was their view of the war was in the trenches. And what The Longest Day tells us is the war up at the general's level and how all these bumbling fools on both sides nearly lost the war on each side through their mistakes. And it's just whoever made the most mistakes is the one that lost that battle, it seems. That's the kind of story that we're telling. As opposed to Private Ryan, where they're down in the trenches because that's something that most Americans of that generation had not experienced this in mm. your face. It's very loud. It's very ugly. And oh, look, look, the, the bullet went through right through my helmet, but I'm still alive. And then the next one takes his head off. Well, you've got, you've got that curious thing where you've got the slew of war movies sort of from the you know, 50s, 60s, and probably early 70s. They are kind, kind of glossy. Uh, and they'll be aimed you know, partly at a generation who was there, yet they all loved them and went and watched them, and yet they know the inaccuracies of it and tolerated them. We see influences of Private Ryan in Gladiator in that opening battle with the use of the, of the shaky cam and the slow-mo and it happened to snow and that just, they just, Ridley Scott used it. Ridley Scott, mm. whatever other problems Ridley Scott may have, he's a very astute filmmaker and he knows how to use what he's got to best effect. Um, yeah. Historical accuracy notwithstanding, I still think Blade Runner is his most historically accurate film. And living in LA, <laughs> believe me, I can tell you what's coming <laughs> All of it. I think I mean, there's, there's also, weirdly on that story, there's that famous uh, anecdote of Eisenhower watching the Audie Murphy biopic and compl- and complaining that the actor that they've got to do that action couldn't do that because he couldn't carry uh, a machine gun by himself. And, of course, not realising that Audie Murphy played himself um, and, and, and therefore was doing what, doing what Audie Murphy did. Um, so... You know, that's sort of like, well, that couldn't happen. You're like, um, yeah, that happened. It's like, yeah, but that actor couldn't do it. Uh, yeah, yeah, he could. So, you know, I think there's that, there's that, there's that as well, that, that sort of um, fog of war and, uh, you know, this is how things evolve and the reality, you know, is, is always going to be different. 
It reminds me of something that came up one time watching, uh, you know, this comes across strange, but a Bond film with, um, uh, who is he, the worst possible Bond in Goldeneye. Um, Pierce Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan. Uh, and of course, as he escapes in the early part of that from a Russian prison and uh, jumps into a uh, Russian tank and then uh, floors it out of a compound and turns a, turns a corner and skids it, fish sails it round the corner. And I, I can remember so many people saying after that, no, that that's rubbish, it can't happen, can't happen, can't happen. And then um, several years later watching a, a news report uh, from uh, war, uh, previous wars in Afghanistan with uh, a Russian-made tank being driven down a road with a whole bunch of Afghan soldiers sitting on top of it and it being flung around the corner and all these guys hanging on for dear life as it fishtails around a corner. And of, of course it's just, you know, it's, it is one of those things that, you know, okay, there's lots of things that you can experiment with in terms of film and actually there is a lot of times that you sort of, fun, funnily enough, just trip across something that you sort of think, oh, it's great for special effects, can't happen in real life, but we'll, we'll exaggerate on this one. But later on you sort of think, hold on, actually, you know, we can find stuff, stuff like that. When I was in the armored cavalry, we'd never have done that with our tanks because we're always afraid of throwing our tracks and you'd spend the next 10 yeah. hours trying to put your track back on. What a pain in the ass that was. So no, you <laughs> wouldn't do it because... I want to go home, I want to get take a shower, get a hot meal yeah, back yeah. at the barracks. I don't want to throw yeah. tracks in the middle of a rice paddy, you know, frozen rice paddy in Korea, where the, mm. where it was frozen over and the tank is skidding along and sliding along. And I watched the tank slide along and I thought, great, it's going to hit the end, go over the side into the gully, and I'm going to be writing paperwork for the next month about how I screwed up my platoon. This is all bad. This is all bad. No one ever does paperwork in war films. You know, which I think it's is certainly non non in gladiator. No, and I think I think that's one of the things is that we know that uh, a lot of command, even in the period of the Roman Republican Empire, was about writing reports back. Yeah, you know, where are the tri where are the tribunes, the military tribunes? Yeah, yeah, where's, yeah, where's, yeah. Where's all of that stuff? Um, which is you know, and and someone would have whether whether they had to whether their optios. Um, it's it's hard to I don't yeah literacy levels I think they would have been more literate than we than we think certainly in in later ages um, they certainly would have been had to have been able to read um, reports uh, or had them read to them but um, yeah it's I mean what we know from you know the the Vindolanda tablets um, they're they're report as with any army of any age they're writing down everything and reporting everything so that's that's what most of your your career would have been spent doing you know and and actual combat would have been few and far between so do you think we've about uh, done the opening scene of gladiator for as much as we're going to I, I, for an hour and a half i i, I <laughs> one one thing that struck me um watching the, the that opening scene again is uh when the the battle has devolved into one-on-one -on -one melee there's two uh, legionary standards shoved into the ground by themselves in the middle of the battle. No one's no one's holding it. No one's fighting for it or near it. They're just stuck there as emblems of look, we've got a Roman battle. And you're like, oh golly gosh, no, 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 no. That would be that would be oh that's so oh my oh, God. I couldn't you know. Um, so coming back to our how big was it? There are two of those, so maybe that's what's meant to be happening. But yeah, there you know that. And coming back to the religious question, you probably would have got some kind of uh, emphasis on the signa um, or the or the vexillium of the of the unit as the as the trust in the standard or something like that, rather than a a, a specific um, you know reference to Elysium. You would have got some kind of reference to you know well you're all up to date with your with your pensions people so well done if if you die you'll be taken care of we'll make sure you're buried and uh your families and wives will get a good payout well done you um you know which is very <laughs> very pragmatic and boring but you know that's what a lot of people are concerned about uh back then and today but by the same measure i mean it might not be you shouldn't really have the two legionary standards in that case maybe you should have Maybe that what they were aiming at was actually something like the, uh, you know, by that stage, you've got the uh, image of the emperor being touted around in front of the army and whatnot, 
Um, you've got uh, other, you know, other paraphernalia being carried in front of the army rather than just your old, you know, eagles and whatnot. It's uh, the variety should be there. Maybe those eagles were captured eagles, and the Germans have brought them along. Ooh, no, no, I don't, I don't, I don't. So we're in a lot of supposition now. We've seen two eagles, and we're maybe jumping to conclusions. I don't think, I don't think the Germans ever took any. I don't think there's ever, ever any evidence of that. Um, you know, who need, who needs evidence? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Actually, they did, they did take. They took um, in uh, eight, uh, eight AD, didn't Varus, they? Yeah, Varus. Varus. Yeah, Varus. Well, you see, but and if they, that... if they were getting back Varus's, uh, the yeah, then that would have been made something of. Maybe that ended up on the cutting room floor. Interesting. But I think, I think that's a good idea. The, that that in the opening speech, he would have made an appeal to unit mm. pride, mm. to the mm. to the the corporate pride of the legion or or whatever unit that was mm -hmm. that let's do this for the honor of those that have gone before us yeah, and yeah. those that will come after us mm -hmm. that something along those lines would have made yeah. sense you do get the marine sort of uh, simplify who you are kind of thing occasionally where where the uh, the cheering unit gives a single voiced cry which has been conducted Ooh. you know and you're like what hang on how didn't you do that at a different time or did you just imaginally give that all at the same moment you do get that with the roma victor when he cries out roma victor they all cry out roma victor behind him you're like god your latin's awful people um you know I, uh, you know there's this you know this academic papers on well, te 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 roman war technically cries most of them should be technically most of them should be auxiliaries anyway so um, yeah. their latin yes. might not be that well that so yeah type. so they just they're just they're just following their their spanish latin speaking incorrectly commander who cries out you know that proves it that, that scott was really a much more subtle and astute historian <laughs> how would we have ever guessed it but he had it right yeah sort of like rome rome's a god and he's a man you're like no oh yeah it's right very very egalitarian very modern you know uh, mm, mm. hail ridley <laughs> and, and i think we should say it before we close off just as you all know, John Hurt, Sir John Hurt just passed away. And he's famous for a lot of films, for things bumping out of his chest and all kinds of other neat things he's done over his time. But his Caligula in the BBC series was nothing short of brilliant. It was an excellent performance that almost never happened because when he was asked to play that part, he declined. He said, no, I'm not really right to play this character. And the producer said, okay, fine. Hey, we're having a cast party at the start of filming because people are going to come and go quickly, so we're all going to be together at the beginning. Come to the party. Hurt went, was so impressed by the assembly of talent he saw there that he went up to the producer and somewhat sheepishly said, can I reconsider my declining this part? I'd really like to be in it. And he goes, that's why I invited you here. Of course you can. I was hoping you'd change your mind. And thank God he did. It's a, it, his Caligula still works um, mm. on a lot of different levels. Historically accurate, nah. You know what? That's one of those cases where I don't care. I love the performance. It works. It works, mm. and it may well be pretty close to the real, the real thing. Mm. Anyway, I just thought John Hurt, great actor, and he'd done some Roman Roman and Greek films, so mm. deserves some mm. mention. Right then, let's let's call that a day then on. Um... Gladiator. We, we, we could come back and do the actual gladiatory part of Gladiator to the point. Well, you'd probably need, you'd need um, to talk about Spartacus and uh, and others, but we could. There's a there's a biggie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Spartacus. Well, yeah. Let Let's leave it there for now. Uh, thank you, uh, Murray, Mark, Mark, and David. Next time we'll be back discussing the magazine, which will be the issue looking at AD sixty eight, the year of the four emperors. If you've not read the issue, you can pick up a copy at ancient-warfare.com. We usually put a call out for questions the week before we record, so keep an eye out on Facebook or Patreon. Speaking of which, if you do enjoy the show, why not show your support by becoming a patron of the show and making a small contribution via Patreon? You will only make a donation when we produce a new podcast and you can set your donation level to whatever you feel we're worth. You'll find more information at patreon.com slash ancient warfare podcast. 
and we thank those loyal listeners who already support the show. It's very much appreciated. Now that really is the end. I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening. <laughs>